South Jamaica, baby, they made me to be the greatest. Serving the deed of my creators, fresh off of my high haters. It's the king again, Magdalene, Shofit, bragging and boasting. Yo, what up, y'all? It's your boy Dollars. Welcome back to the channel. It's another day, another dollar video, and I'm going to be reacting to the Bacon Brothers largest turf war in modern bc history i know y'all wanted me to react to the other one um i think it was called the war in bc but i feel like this is the same thing like i feel like it's gonna be a tie-in to the other video and this is from hood tv so i believe this is like some some shit that's going down in uh, british columbia canada a uh, turf war i don't know if these guys are like some type of mafia shit or mob but um we gonna check it out, man. I know y'all wanted me to do this anyway, so if y'all still want me to do the other one, I'll do it too when I get a chance. But I wanted to do this one because this one seemed like it was a little bit more interesting, and it got way more views anyway. So I figured this would be the one to do anyway. Let's hop in this joint. Let's check it out. Jonathan Bacon had many enemies, but he wasn't one to hide behind bodyguards. With How his your last brothers, name Bacon Jared and Jamie, they formed the vicious Red Scorpion gang. You know they ain't Arabic or they ain't Muslim with a last name like Bacon, you feel me? Like, I, I ain't never heard of some shit like that. Well, there are people with the last name Ham, like John Ham and shit like that. But Bacon? I don't know. Well, Kevin Bacon, too. I, I'm chatting right now because there is a Kevin Bacon. All right, let me bring that back. Jonathan Bacon had many enemies, but he wasn't one to hide behind bodyguards. Mm. With his younger brothers, Jared... And he said Jim, he don't need no security. The vicious Red Scorpion gang. He said he got it. He got it on him. He don't need no security in the club. You heard? <laughs> Launching a murderous drug turf war against the rival UN gang. Well, there will certainly be payback. Hey guys, in today's video, we'll be gang. taking a look at the notorious British Columbian gangster trial, the Bacon Brothers, and the huge turf war they were involved in, which is actually one of BC's deadliest of all time. Damn. Many gangs in BC were involved, mainly the United Nations Gang and the Red Scorpions, as well as the Hells Angels, Independent Soldiers, and the Doc Dure Group. I've previously made videos on BC gangsters like Bindi Johal and gangs like the Brothers Keepers on this channel, but today we'll be talking about how the Bacon Brothers added their own unique flair of Canadian gangsterism to their home city of Abbotsford and the wider BC area. Abbotsford's location is near an unmanned border with a- I ain't gonna lie bro. You, but you got to get a different mic or you got to edit it to a point where it sounds a little bit more clearer. Right now, I feel like I'm watching a, a video from Anonymous, the hacker group, bro, the way he sounds, you know, but it sounds worse because at least you can understand what Anonymous is saying. With him, it's like a little bit, you know, choppy. You got to get a better mic or you got you to gotta do something with the audio, brother to their home city of Abbotsford and the wider BC area. Abbotsford's location is near an unmanned border with the United States, and the wealth generated by the lucrative drug trade makes it a natural breeding ground for gang conflict. Of course, they by the border. associated with three things, drugs, money, and power. It was mm -hmm. the charm of these three that raised the trial of brothers to a life of crime. The Bacon brothers were born in a wealthy household in Abbotsford, and as kids, they took an active interest in sports. The youngest of the three, Jamie Bacon, was even a provincial high school wrestling champion in his senior year. Damn. However, the brothers chose a life of crime despite coming from a functional family. They were dealing in drugs and guns as early as 2002 when they ate. So you heard what he said? They chose to do a life of crime even though they came from a functional good family. They were wealthy. And that's a lot of times in the hood that shit happens, man. Like, I know a bunch of kids I grew up with that they didn't have to hustle. They didn't have to be in the streets, but they still wanted to, you know, just to be down, though. It wasn't because they, they really was about that shit. They just wanted to be down. Not saying that everybody that does that shit ain't real, you know, because there's some real ones that still come from middle class family. I mean, I came from a good family and I still did bad shit. You know, but not to that level. Yeah, bring that back. Damn, I didn't mean to do that. They were dealing in drugs and guns as early as 2002 when their 18-year-old middle brother, Jared, was convicted of unauthorized possession of a prohibited weapon. Jared later confessed in court that the brothers made a conscious decision to become gangsters when still in their teens. The Bacon brothers wow. gained notoriety quickly and were said to be responsible for huge- So when they was teenagers, they woke up and chose violence. They're like, nah, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be- gangsters damn but why why choose a life of crime when these guys could have probably been successful lawyers doctors 
You know, they had all the opportunities to win at life, but they chose to go the opposite route. That's crazy. Huge waves of violence that spilled over onto the streets in Vancouver. Despite the eyes of the law being firmly on them, the brothers were living a life in the fast lane. They weren't too concerned about keeping a low profile since they were commonly seen in public with their flashy cars, beautiful women, and a total disregard for the laws. Mm. They weren't just gangsters, they were inspiring others to follow in their footsteps. They were the leaders. young child became a part of organized crime when they joined the infamous United Nations Gang, which was operating in Abbotsford, BC since 1997. The gang was called the United Nations because of the diverse ethnic identities of its members. I was just about to say, yo, United Nations, like, what the f what's going on with that, bro? That's crazy. They had a whole diverse clique, bro. All different backgrounds and from different, I don't know, man. That's crazy. The UN group was heading a profitable drug running enterprise in the early 2000s when they were said to be trading the famous British Colombian cannabis in return for cocaine to be sold in Canada and even had helicopters which would be going back and forth through the Canadian and United States border. Damn. However, things soon started to go south for the UN gang. Their connections with the triad and expanding operations in the US put the gang firmly on the law enforcement radar. The drug trade was also shifting with cocaine becoming more and more profitable. But cocaine trade was the hallmark of the Red Scorpions gang. Originally formed in 2005. In nah, they was like, nah, y'all not cutting into our, our shit, you feel me? Y'all had y'all little run with the, the, the cannabis, but now y'all want to get into our business and take some of our profits? Nah, obviously that's going to lead to a war. A youth detention center in Vancouver, BC, the Red Scorpions gang was already at odds with the UN gang to get greater control of Vancouver, mm. BC's drug trafficking operations. The ambitious brothers jumped ship and joined hands with the Red Scorpions. It was a bitter turn in the rivalry between the two gangs and made the brothers the biggest enemies of the UN group. Authorities described their brothers as being quote unquote completely fearless and believed that they quickly took charge of the operations at the Red Scorpion gang. What followed was a cycle of violence through the likes of one of the bloodiest turf wars BC has ever seen. I am Charlie D'Amelio from TikTok. I don't know how Charlie blew up. Jonathan Bacon, a traitor in the eyes of the UN gang, was targeted outside his home in September 2006, but survived the murder attempt. Legal troubles also continued for the Bacons, so in February 2007, they left their Abbotsford home and moved into a luxurious home in Surrey, BC. Surrey, unlike Abbotsford, does not have its own police force, and is patrolled by an RCMP detachment. This makes it easier for their Bacon brothers to run their drug trafficking operations because- What? So you mean to tell me wherever they move to does not have no type of law enforcement? So what the fuck they have? Public safety or some shit? Like, that's crazy. So they were able to operate the operation without having to worry about police. Obviously, the feds were probably watching them or some shit, but they didn't have local law enforcement. It's crazy. February 2007, they left their Abbotsford home and moved into a luxurious home in 3 BC. Surrey, unlike Abbotsford, does not have its own police force and is patrolled by an RCMP detachment. This makes it easier for their Bacon brothers to run their drug trafficking RCMP. operations because the RCMP were fewer in numbers and the officers were generally stationed for a short time. However, a change of home did not stop the murder plots and violence. In April 2007, the youngest brother, Jamie, was the target when his Corvette was bombarded with bullets as he pulled into his Surrey home. Damn. Jamie fired back with the Glock taken from an SUV parked in the family's garage, causing the police to search the SUV. They ended up finding four semi auto guns and five loaded pistol magazines hidden in a secret compartment. So he had the semi-autos, but he chooses to use a handgun in a gunfight. Yeah, that didn't make sense right there. Many of the guns had middle brother Jared's fingerprints, even though he wasn't present in the house at the time. Both Jamie and Jared Bacon were charged with weapons possession. The move to Surrey also gave way to new gang-related rivalries for the Bacons. One of these rivals were Corey Law, who was running a dial dope operation at the Balmoral apartment tower. Law also tried oh. to convince a Bacon- What? dial a dope <laughs> one 800 dial a dope man. You call this number and- they going to take care of you. Whatever you need, they're going to serve you. They're going to they gonna take your order and send the delivery man to you. That's what that shit sound like. 1-800-DOLLAR-DOPE. <laughs> That's hilarious. To new gang-related rivalries for the Bacons. One of these rivals were Corey Law, who was running a dial dope operation at the Balmoral apartment tower. Law also tried to convince a Bacon Brothers associate to work for him instead. 
And this did not That's sell a no -no. well with Jamie, who was quoted as saying, that kid's a little Zeke, he's a little bitch, I'm going to jack him. He shouldn't be working in our town, we run this town. Jamie demanded Corey to either hand over a drug line to him or pay a $100,000 tax imposed by Jamie for badmouthing him. Wow. However, Corey refused his offer, meaning that from the Bacon Brothers perspective, Corey had- I ain't gonna lie, that picture looked like he dead already. Like, it's one of those pictures you see that they show in the news when somebody gets killed. It's one of those pictures that they choose. That he, like, rest in peace, man. Like, I already know he's not with us no more. Just by the picture they chose, well, the picture he chose for the video. He had to die. Crazy, so on October bro. 19th, 2007, three Red Scorpion members entered the Balmoral Tower to carry out the hit. However, their plan began going sideways when the killers arrived at Lal's apartment and found out that he wasn't alone. Corey Lal was with his brother and two business associates, as well as a gas fitter who had no connection with the gangsters, but was inside their apartment on a service call. As the Red Scorpions members were looking to clear out the hallway, Lal's next door neighbor, Chris Mohan, was leaving for a basketball game. The assassins didn't want to take a risk of being identified, and they hauled the innocent Chris into the apartment along with their rivals. All six men were forced to lie on the floor and shot. Seven wow. long years later, and the shooters were all eventually charged with first degree murder and the conspiracy to commit murder. That's a massacre. Jimmy's case would end up taking That's not a murder. This. On the streets, the deadly rivalry with the UN gang was becoming even deadlier. Several associates of the UN gang were out to kill their brothers after the death of popular UN gang member named Dwayne Mayer, who was shot to death in Abbotsford on May 8, 2008. Killed the very next day was Jonathan Barber, a stereo installer from Langley, BC, who had just taken Jamie Bacon's Porsche to work on it. According to witness testimonies, four members of the UN gang were all in Wrong a truck and chased Barber's vehicle thinking Jamie Bacon was inside. One of the UN members opened fire at the vehicle, killing Barber and injuring a 17-year-old girlfriend. On May 31st, 2008, Vancouver BC's Integrated Gang Task Force warned those associated with Jonathan, Jared, and Jamie to steer clear of the trial or be potentially marked for death. That was indeed the case as just months after the warning, eight Bacon associates had been murdered. On January 2009, the bloody gang war that was being played out in the streets of Vancouver killed 20 and wounded 40 people in a span of the first three months. Damn. The murder plots against the brothers also continued, with at least 11 suspects arrested in connection to conspiracies to kill the Bacon brothers and their gang associates between January 1st, 2008 and February 17th, 2009. One of these elaborate plots was to bomb their Abbotsford residence. A former UN gang member tested- Wow. They were going to bomb homeboy's crib up. Hmm. The number of bodies that were dropping, they were already going to be on the radar of the police and the feds. But once you get a bomb involved, bro, that's like some next level terrorism shit, bro. If, if they weren't watching you before that, after that, they definitely going to be watching y'all, bro. To fight in court that the group discussed dropping a bomb for one of its helicopters to kill a sibling trial. What? But a helicopter would have been too difficult to arrange logistically, while the danger of collateral damage was also much higher. The gang also considered other violent options like, like a rocket launcher and grenades to hit the Bacon brothers with. However, they were unsuccessful in arranging those weapons as well. Things weren't going smoothly for the Bacon brothers from a legal standpoint either. Jamie Bacon was arrested in the 36 case in April 2009, and in 2010 he was convicted of 10 counts of possessing guns and ammunition at the Bacon family home in Surrey and was given a 7 year sentence. Hmm. The middle brother Jared Bacon was arrested just a month after Jamie on weapons and drug trafficking charges. On the outside, with both of his brothers in prison, the eldest brother Jonathan was trying to make new alliances. He contacted Larry Amaro of the Hells Angels Biker Gang and James Ryak of the Independent Soldiers. Together, the three formed the Wolfpack Alliance to expand their operations to other parts of the country. Wolfpack. However, he was soon to be caught up in another brewing rivalry. The BC Gang Wars went through a monumental moment after the murder of the famous BC gangster, Grimmie Doc. Co-founder of the Doc Dure Group outside Metroton Mall in October 2010. Grimmie was closely associated with the UN gang and had even contacted them to get rid of some of his rivals in the Hells Angels and the Independent Soldiers. The Doc Dure Group was an alliance formed between some of the Bacon Brothers rivals in response to the formation of the Wolfpack Alliance. Grimmie's targeted hit became a critical moment in the lower mainland gang rivalries and caused a war that resulted in the killings of some of the biggest gang leaders in Vancouver. Grimmie's brother, Suck Doc, blamed Independent Soldier <laughs> His name is what? Yo, his name is Suck Doc. That shit sound funny, bro. <laughs> Even though he ain't a he ain't a funny individual, you don't want to fuck with. His name, bro, sounds hilarious, bro. 
Y'all know what it sound like. <laughs> That's crazy. Ryak and Hells his parents hated him for his brother's death and wanted revenge. On August 14th, 2011, Jonathan Bacon was partying with his new associates in Kelowna, a city 275 kilometers east of Vancouver, where they were ambushed by three masked men when leaving the Grand Delta Hotel in a white Porsche. The attackers were later identified as members of the Doc Dure group. Larry Amaro escaped with injuries while James Ryak managed to run from the scene. However, the head of the Red Scorpion gang, the eldest Bacon brother, Jonathan, was wounded severely and soon collapsed and passed away due to his injuries. Damn. Two women who were in the car with the three gangsters also sustained multiple non-fatal injuries. Three members of the Doc Dure Alliance were arrested in relation to the hit in 2013. In the aftermath of the killing, the police claimed that while they kept track of the likelihood of any attacks on known gangsters, this one slipped through the cracks. Yeah, okay. What followed Jonathan Bacon's daylight murder was a wave of it slipped through the cracks. It's probably because they wanted wanted that to happen. You feel me? Sometimes the 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 cops that have information something's gonna go down, but they want to let the crime happen because if they arrest you before the crime happens, then you know their case ain't gonna be as strong. But if they allow it to happen, I don't know if they could get in trouble for that. I think they can if they knowingly allowed somebody to get killed, knowing that it was gonna happen. That may be a charge, but they could always make up some BS, regardless. Brutal retaliation that took out dozens in a span of months. Just two months later in October, a Doc Dure associate who had been a part of the Kelowna hunt was shot to death in Surrey, BC. And at the start of 2012, the second most prominent member of the Doc Dure syndicate was shot down on January 17th. Get Sandeep back, Dure gang. was in the lobby of the Sheraton Wall Center when he was shot multiple times in front of a stunned audience. Hells Angels Larry Amaro has been convicted of the killing. Sandeep Dure was running the Dure group with his two brothers at the time. He had formed an alliance with Grimi Doc to counter the rising influence of the original Wolfpack alliance. But that wasn't the ending of the Wolfpack revenge. In fact, the violent killings continued across the border all the way in Mexico with the murder of a man named Tom Gisby, a major organized Mexico. crime figure in BC for decades. Gisby had been working closely with Grimi Doc for years. The payback for Kelowna continued. Suk Doc, who was now heading the Doc group after the murder of his brother Grimit, had allegedly issued the orders for the hit on Amaro, Riak, and Jonathan Bacon. Witness testimonies say that Suk texted the attackers after Jonathan's killing and said, Congratulations and law, go have a drink. On Monday, November 26th, wow. 2012, both Suk Doc and his bodyguard were shot to death at Burnaby's Executive Hotel. But even after the killing of the alleged Kelowna shooting mastermind, the murders did not stop. On January 15th, 2013, two of Doc's crew members directly involved in the Bacon murder were targeted in Surrey. Meanwhile, attempts to kill Jamie Bacon continued inside prison. Yeah. A UN gang member. I was just gonna think about that. Like, bro, homeboys in jail, they definitely dealing with some type of war in the jail. Because once you locked up, you know, there's people that you got beef with that's in there too. So I was wondering, like, what's going on with them in jail? That's... <laughs> This is a fucking movie. Honestly, this is a TV show. This makes Sons of Anarchy look PG-13, if you ask me, man. I'm pretty sure they should make something out of this. Like, it's crazy. If they don't make a show about this, that's like an opportunity, like, lost. It was reported to be plotting to put cyanide inside steroids that Jamie was getting smuggled into prison in 2019. Cyanide, damn. While Jamie was awaiting trial for the 36 murder case, the attempts proved unsuccessful. The bloody gang war slowed after prominent members of the Hells Angels, the UN gang, and the Red Scorpions, especially Jamie and Jared Bacon, were put behind bars. Jamie Bacon pleaded guilty in the 36 killings and got the first degree murder charges dropped in a bargain. He was sentenced to 18 years in prison in September 2020, meaning that it took 13 years to get to this point. This is because of how over 1,300 officers and 80 police informants were needed for prosecution in building this case. Not only this, but a former investigator was found guilty in 2019 to a breach of trust and attempted obstruction of justice due to his romantic relationship with the key witness. Jamie will serve a total of 5 years and 7 months after factoring nearly 12 years in pretrial detention. Jared Bacon was acquitted from the weapons charge in 2010, but remained in custody after being found guilty of trying to smuggle $3 million worth of cocaine into Canada in 2009. Jared was caught agreeing to buy 100 kilograms of Mexican cocaine from an undercover police operative in a sting operation. Jared originally received a 12-year sentence, which was later increased to 14 years, amounting to a total of 9 years and 2 months after including time served in pretrial custody. He was released from prison twice during the span of his sentence. He was first released in 2017 by accident due to an error. 
However, he was arrested months later for violating his release conditions of not being allowed in drinking establishments, as well as not being allowed to communicate with other criminals. He violated these conditions a few months after his release since he was arrested in a strip club and was with another offender. Turns out that he actually gave a false identity to the police and was acting aggressively towards them by trying to break the window of the police vehicle he was confined in. He was released again in July 2018, but just 5 months later, his release was suspended once again after he tested positive for cocaine. And finally released from prison for a third time. What the fuck is he on? A lifetime parole or some shit? Like, he can never drink again or some shit? Because it seems like every time they release him, he wants to party, drinks. I mean, the drug part, obviously, I understand if you're on parole, probation, you know, you can't get away with that, but... Like, what the fuck, bro? Couldn't just do your probation or some shit, your parole, and get it over with? I'm on March 19th, 2021. Jared is a free man yet again. However, he the court cautions that the gangster is still capable of violence and maintain ties with criminal organizations throughout the time of his prison sentence. Jared will now have to live under strict surveillance conditions in a halfway house until it is determined that he no longer presents a risk to society. Court documents have also revealed that the notorious gangster requested to be released in a different region for his safety. The Bacon brothers seem to have made a conscious decision to step outside the law. Unfortunately for them, nothing in the criminal underworld is permanent and shifting alliances, rivalries and police work eventually caught up with each of them. And also caused one of the bloodiest wars that BC's crime scene has seen for a very long time. Please Man. like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to- I thought Toronto was lit. <laughs> Y'all was making it seem like Toronto was lit, but over there, BC, nah. Them dudes over there was getting it popping, bro. Ain't gonna lie, like I said, this is like a movie material story right there, bro. All the shit that was going on. That's crazy, bro. The three brothers. Ah, man. You know, kids, you know, it shows you that the life of crime ain't really the life to choose, bro. You know, you always got to worry about people getting back on you. You always got to watch your back. You never know when it's going to come for you. Honestly, that's not the life, man. But, you know, especially when you don't have to live that way. They just chose to live that way. But, yeah, man, this was an interesting video. Um, Y'all let me know if y'all want me to react to Bindi Johal and uh, any other videos from Hood TV. But, uh, yeah, if you're new to the channel, drop a like, comment, subscribe. It's your boy. Mahalo at ya. For my time goes by, they gon' raise a nigga jersey in the sky. Treat a nigga right, big dreaming all my life. Shorty wanna get some air, I go and get up when I fly. Taking off on these niggas, I retire. The minute I catch fire, I smoked them all before, just revisiting the high.